All right, um, welcome and welcome to today's webinar on live data analytics in professional football. Um, I'm Floris Goes, and as the head of data science at SciSports, I lead a team of data scientists with a passion for football analytics, uh, as well as for bringing state-of-the-art data science solutions to the pitch. Um, we really enjoy what we do, and we hope that you enjoy our presentation today about what we do as well. It's great to see such a large turnout today with already 77 people joining uh, today's webinar. Um, with people from a lot of different disciplines in professional football in a lot of different countries. That's really great to see. As data science is really all about, well, doing research and learning from the rest of the community, I think doing this kind of thing is, is a key aspect of, of our work and, and something we really enjoy as well as really learn uh, from as well. So today, basically within the next 30 minutes or so, I would like to give you a bird's eye view on uh, building a real-time application uh, used by the staff of professional football teams during an actual game. At SciSports, we're specialized in building cloud-based data analytics applications um, for professional football clients, and our real-time application has been one of our most recent innovations. So my goal of today, uh, of today's webinar, is basically to give you insights into four different topics. Um, to begin with, a real-time dashboard to monitor physical performance of players during a game, um, as well as then the second point, the quality and accuracy of live data versus post-match data, uh, and what constraints you have to account for when interpreting uh, data in, in real time, um, followed by the especially technical challenges behind building uh, real-time pipelines, uh, especially as, as compared to uh, well, what, we, what we've been used uh, doing uh, for the past couple of years, which is building post-match uh, pipelines. And finally, I would like to conclude with a, a short discussion on the future of real-time data analytics. Um, this has actually been the first season that we've, uh, well, th that we've implemented real-time data analytics in professional football, at least at SciSports, and we're developing fast. And I would like to at least shed some light on, from our side on what's more in store in terms of real-time data analytics. Um, but given the, well, the, the fast and experienced group of people in, in this webinar, I'm also very curious about hearing your opinions uh, and, and your perspective on that um, at the end of today. Um, and then finally, we'll conclude with at least a 10 minutes Q&A session. Um, where I'll try to answer as much questions as I can. Um, I would also like to extend a warm welcome to Josh, who is our moderator today, and who will help me in, in well, basically uh, answering the questions that you ask me in the chat box, and I'll get back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, so, um, before we dive into providing real-time data insights, it's important to understand what uh, what kind of data we're talking about when it comes to football data. A lot of you will probably already be familiar with this, um, but given the variety in the audience, I'll do a quick recap on what we're actually talking about when we talk about football data. So in our case, we typically work with two different data streams. On the one hand, we have the event data stream um, that contains manually uh, annotated event data uh, that is annotated by human observers uh, and mostly concerns on-ball events. This data stream represents the match as a time series of actions. Think passes, tackles, shots, uh, goals, that kind of thing. And an average match contains about two to 3,000 uh, data points or two to 3,000 match events and uh, represents about two to three megabyte in size um, when it comes to the data. While on the other hand, uh, also shown here in the screen, uh, we have the tracking data stream, which contains uh, uh, tracking data that is automatically being collected by, uh, in our case, uh, optical tracking systems, uh, and that tracks all moving objects on the field. So referee, assistant referee, the ball, uh, all the players are tracked with uh, typically 25 uh, uh, frames per second. And as a result, this data stream represents a match as a time series of X and Y positions of all moving objects. And the average match has about 3 million data points uh, and is about 100 megabytes in size. Now, both data streams can serve various purposes in terms of match analysis or performance analysis, but the most powerful analysis typically comes from a combination of both streams. Um, for example, by syncing event and tracking data in time, and then detecting position sequences in the event data while constructing features over those sequences 
using tracking data. And this enables one to, for example, uh, automatically generate uh, video playlists enriched with features uh, coming from the data, 2D uh, animations uh, of the tracking data, uh, and all using data-driven models. However, um, while this is great for post-match performance analysis, a real-time application requires a different set of insights, as you need to be able to make split-time decisions in-game and don't really have the time for extensive uh, analysis that will, will, will take you uh, a more extensive amount of time. So for that reason, uh, we've built a live insights dashboard, and that's what I would like to talk about uh, with you today, both with respect to the contents as well as the, the technical uh, ideas behind it. And the, the goal of the Live Insights dashboard is to allow the, ana the analysts to get a quick overview of both team and player performance during the game. So before we go into the technical details of uh, streaming data into a pipeline and, and serving real-time insights to an application, uh, let's take a look at what such a Live Insights dashboard actually entails. So here you can see a physical performance overview of a team during the 14th minute of a game. So an anonymized view uh, actually taken, uh, well, uh, from a, a live situation uh, inside the game. Let's break down the various elements we can see on this dashboard, um, as well as take a small peek under the hood of, of how those elements are, are composed. Um, because underneath what you see here, underneath the dashboard that you see here, uh, there are at least six different technical elements that are integrated together into one seamless application. So first of all, we are monitoring the status of the data streams. So underneath this dashboard, there's a pipeline that processes event data, that processes tracking data streams in, in real time. And uh, both data streams are served by external providers um, and, and can suffer uh, downtime as well, uh, given that we're in a live situation. By monitoring the sampling rate, so monitoring how fast and how often data comes in, we can quickly signal issues with data as well as notify the provider. And due to the fact that we basically stream the, the data directly into a UI, we're often able to report downtime and issues before data providers themselves even have noticed uh, uh, the issue, um, allowing us to, to well, maximize uh, the amount of data that we can show and minimize the amount of downtime of our uh, live application. Now, while that stream is running, the, des the dashboard uh, gets updated frequently. While a typical application would consume tables in the database that are served by the backend uh, uh, to the front end through an API. This is not the case uh, for a real time application. Um, instead, this application features an event driven architecture. Now, what I mean by that, um, an event driven architecture means that the various elements on this page are updated asynchronously when they happen. This means that, uh, for example, the stream status, the score line, in this case, is zero to one, uh, the uh, for example, substitutions, card indicators uh, that you don't see on this screen, of course, because there haven't been any substitutions or cards in the 14th minute. Um, and also the aggregated KPIs are all updated by independent processes uh, and served directly to the front end, something with which I will share the technical details with you later on in the presentation. As a result, the various elements on this page are, are, or in this dashboard rather, are updated asynchronously and you'll see updates every 30 to 45 seconds in a match. Now, the main part of this dashboard is actually a set of physical performance KPIs uh, to quickly allow an assessment of the physical performance of a team as well as a player and compare teams and players against each other. Um, and on the dashboard, we've grouped KPIs in two different categories. In the top, marked red here, we see the team level aggregations, where we provide a quick overview of the physical performance of a team aggregated over all outfield players, so excluding the goalkeeper. While at the bottom, we provide a similar set of KPIs, but then on a player level. Now, as compared to our post-match physical performance analysis, um, this overview is much more comprehensive. In a real-time situation, you don't want a screen cluttered with a lot of details, but you want to be able to get quick insights uh, to make uh, turnkey split-time des uh, decisions. So therefore, we decided to focus on a limited amount of KPIs, in this case, the total distance covered uh, by a player, uh, runs and sprints, especially high-intensity runs and sprints made by a player, uh, distance covered in the uh, high-intensity speed zones, especially, um, 
and uh, uh, all that in a UI that allows the user to visually assess uh, inter-player and inter-team difference, differences quickly as well, by not only showing the numbers, but also showing the, uh, well, relative differences between players in a visual way. And then finally, as the final element uh, on this page, um, we provide the user with a static report with more detailed information that is available during halftime as well as right after the match. We like to, cons to consider this as a halftime report and an in the bus report. Now, by automatically running a report at the 45 minute marker, as well as at the end of the match, um, we make sure our reports are available before the team enters the locker room, as well as before a team enters the bus after a match to basically enable um, to get a quick grasp of what's going on in a half or in a match right when you come off the pitch. Now, if we take a look at that report, um, in addition to the physical performance details, uh, also featured on the dashboards, the dashboard, because you'll also have that as pages in the report. The report also contains a page on the interaction between tactical contacts and physical performance. Um, now, why is that? Research has shown um, that physical performance by itself is often not directly relatable to match outcome. But when you assess physical performance specific to a game phase, it's a whole different story. Uh, for example, a paper I, um, I've been working on myself uh, during my PhD research has shown that analysis over 40,000 uh, attacking sequences, um, where we've analyzed counterplay and open play sequences and compared successful against non-successful attacks, uh, has shown that during successful attacks, there's a significantly higher uh, physical performance intensity as compared to non-successful attacks. Um, and uh, so this and other research has shown that if you uh, assess physical performance in a given tactical context, it's actually quite relatable to overall performance. So this gives some extra depth to the physical performance assessment that we provide in real time. Um, and it's received by a coach basically one minute uh, after uh, the 45 minute mark and a couple of minutes after the end of the match uh, to be able to make a quick assessment. Now. That has given you some insight in what a real-time application looks like um, and what specific technical features we develop to make it behave in the way it does. But what about the live data quality? Um, data quality is important because both event and tracking data streams normally go through post-processing routines before they are made available to the user, um, which is something that's obviously impossible in a real-time situation because post-processing involves uh, things like imputing missing data, correcting faulty annotations, and other manual quality improvements that you cannot really do uh, properly in a real-time situation. So when this is not an option, how does it affect data quality and uh, what specific uh, uh, aspects do you have to take into account when interpreting data in real time? Now, to answer this question, we've compared real-time and post-match analysis over uh, 200 matches. This, uh, the results show that a lack of post-processing indeed causes some error margins to account for in live data. These errors are typically larger for manually event, uh, manual annotated event data, as could be expected. Um, and uh, they are a bit smaller thus in tracking data. Now, it can be challenging to annotate match events in real time. And replay footage can also include certain events from the broadcast feed, making it even impossible to properly uh, annotate, annotate events uh, right away. So as a result, we see a approximately 10% error margin in the event data streams and a 5% error margin in the tracking data streams. Now, in practice, this means that most um, live, so real-time KPIs will, will be 5 to 10% lower than their post-match equivalents. You can see that also in the box plots visualized here. Um, where you can see that, for example, there are in a live situation, there are on average less shots annotated and that the physical performance intensity is also a bit lower in a live situation. Now, for the event data, this is probably perfectly explainable, right? Where uh, manual annotation is a bit more error prone uh, during a live situation. But why um, uh, is this error happening in tracking data? Um, now, let's, uh, let, let's take a look at that. Um, tracking data basically suffers two challenges in a live situation. The one challenge being missing data, um, which is uh, a bit higher in a live situation than in post-match situations. And the other challenge is uh, the fact that um, tracking players at high speed 
is more difficult for an optical system than tracking players at lower speeds. So what you see in the tracking data is actually that there's a bit of missing data uh, um, in a live situation for players. And there's a bit decrease in, especially the high intensity distance being covered. Now uh, that leads to, um, well, at most 5% decrease of total distance and um, uh, the high intensity distances especially. All in all, the important takeaway is that the overall patterns in the data actually remain the same during a live situation as compared during a post-match situation. But that live KPIs can actually be a bit decreased as compared to the post-match KPIs. Performing comparisons like, for example, uh, benchmark analysis of fatigue um, uh, should therefore always uh, be done using a comparison of live versus live data because comparisons might throw you off uh, and, and result in a different conclusion if you start comparing live data against uh, post data from previous matches. Now, now that we've covered what the application looks like, as well as what the data looks like in real time, let's open up the hood of the data science and data engineering that's underneath it all. Normally, we receive data within 24 hours after a match uh, and process a match data set once. In our case, the raw files come in and the backend triggers a data pipeline through our API. Um, this pipeline is the responsibility of our data science team. Uh, our pipelines are built using Microsoft Azure architecture. Specifically, we construct our pipelines using Databricks, Delta Lake, uh, Microsoft Data Factory, uh, and SQL Server. Now, what does this look like? Raw data enters our pipeline on the left and is then processed through a series of notebooks that run on a Databricks cluster in the cloud. Here you see a simplified version of our pipeline, as in reality, our post-match pipeline features about 40 different notebooks that either sequentially or in parallel can perform certain parts of the analysis, like pre-processing the data, constructing hundreds of features, uh, running aggregations, and making predictions uh, using our models. These notebooks then output their data to Delta tables um, stored on our Azure, Azure blob storage. Delta tables are high performance partition tables that feature a uh, locking, la locking layer and a query engine. And basically together with the Databricks notebooks uh, make up the lake house architecture that uh, characterizes our uh, data science pipelines. And then the whole process is orchestrated as a pipeline by Azure Data Factory. Uh, and in the end, data is being sent to a SQL Server database so that it can be served to an application, in our case, a, our performance center that also features the, uh, the live uh, uh, pipeline. Um, and while this is a techni technically complicated process, um, it also takes quite some time to run a match. So given the number of computations, size of the data, it, it normally takes about 10 to 15 minute, minutes to process an entire match and basically compute and construct all the features that we need. Um, and while this is fine in a post-match situation, um, in a live situation, this, this is obviously undesirable as you want to have the data available with as little latency as possible. So when we began developing our live pipeline, we basically had to rethink the entire process. As a live pipeline, as opposed to a post-match pipeline, is uh, is much more time sensitive, uh, and therefore our streaming pipeline is started well before the match, and instead of running once, it runs continuously throughout the entire match. And so let's let's take a look at what that live pipeline looks like as opposed to the post-match uh, pipeline. Um, instead of serving raw files, uh, the backend uses webhooks to send data packages to our streaming pipeline by using Azure Event Hubs. Basically, the event hub is consumed by constantly streaming data into Delta streaming tables in our pipeline, as well as sending process data again back from those tables to event hubs to, uh, where necessary, expose this to external parties. And instead of mostly sequential processes in the pipeline, various sub-processes are constantly running in parallel to perform different parts of the analysis, where they iteratively, iteratively run the process consuming the latest arrived data packages until the match has finished again and again and again and again. Um, the result is basically a mini batch processing pipeline that in, instead of processing an entire data set, uh, caches checkpoints and is able to serve data with under two minutes latency to an application. 
So uh, you have to consider that data comes in with a, a small delay uh, from the provider, which is uh, 10 to 18 seconds. And then we process it in 60 to 90 seconds to serve it to the dashboard. And the data that you see is actually, so let's say, a near-time analysis that has under, under two minutes delay uh, as compared to the game that is being, uh, being played out. Um, now, excuse me, exposing the, uh, the data finally uh, requires also a different solution as compared to the post-match situation, as sending so many updates to a database would not be the most performant uh, solution. Instead, the pipeline sends messages directly to the front end user signal R, basically omitting the database largely from the process and uh, creating a direct connection between our streaming pipeline and our front end. So, all in all, that, that has given you some insights in what our um, dashboard on the front, front side of things looks like, as well as what the pipeline streaming data to the dashboard on uh, the back end of things looks like. Um, at this point, this has, that has resulted in a, a live insights dashboard that uh, allows users to assess the physical performance of their team uh, during the game. But what could the future hold? Um, I'll shed some light on that, but I also I'm, I'm very curious uh, uh, to hear your uh, your opinions and ideas on it as well in the in the chat. Um, so this is where we are right now, right? We just began uh, with it uh, uh, this season, and we have real time exertion or physical performance insights. We provide half time and full time reports through time sensitive pipelines, and one could think of additional, basically descriptive analysis that uh, uh, could extend this. So next to physical performance insights you could think of uh, advanced match statistics that are uh, coming or are related to to events or to technical uh, insights um, but they all serve a descriptive purposes basically allowing analysis analysis to do uh, an, an analyst to do a quick scan of how a team is performing uh, physically tactically and so on um, one next step could actually be to not only assess a match in a stateless way, but also uh, compare performance in a match to previous matches, obviously using live data and not, not post it, uh, match data because of uh, issues I just discussed. Um, this could theoretically allow to not only uh, assess the number of meters a, a player has run at this point, for example, but also by comparing uh, physical performance of a player to previous performance, assess fatigue, um, and, uh, for example, signal players that theoretically uh, could be up for a substitution, especially if you start combining physical and tactical performance, where you not only see that the player is starting to become fatigued, but you could also assess that he is not executing his tactical task uh, as expected anymore. While, and that is really down the road, uh, uh, to be honest, if you look into the future, uh, also given that well, data and data analytics uh, is still relatively new as a whole uh, as well. You could even think about uh, doing a real-time predictive analysis where uh, using data, you could manipulate um, or well, you could simulate the manipulations you have in mind. So what if I substitute this player? What if I change the formation? What if I uh, uh, give this instruction? How would that play out to um, not and I think that's a key point to not really, um, well, substitute the coach and not at all, but um, to allow a coach and to allow a staff to make more informed decisions um, because there's so much going on during, during a game and you can never assess everything at once um, that data can help you to make more informed decisions by simulating uh, the manipulations that you have in mind and giving you a couple of tools to, uh, well, to uh, basically decide in the end what player you, you should substitute, uh, who you should bring in, um, what instructions you should give, how you should change information. But that is something that, well, in my opinion, is something that is really down the line uh, in the end. Um, all in all, together, this, this provides, I think, a, uh, uh, a, an interesting perspective towards the future where we, I think, just so far, just scratched the surface of what is possible um and we're really just learning uh about what could be possible and, and what could be really helpful uh in a real-time situation using data analytics um so yeah I, I would like to thank you all for for joining today's webinar um i'll quickly switch to the to the question box to see about questions um but uh 
also right after this this webinar i'll be available for the next hour on twitter as well to continue the discussion and to to answer any of the other questions or to discuss the future of these pipelines uh, um, with you as well so feel free to join me there as well now let me have a look at the questions um so i see a couple of questions uh, uh came in um uh, I'll answer them one by one and uh, you should be able to see the question I'm answering uh, on the screen uh, when I answer them. So there's a question by Vina about uh, retraining uh, models at half time with first half live data, good or bad. Um, well, it's a very good question. And um, in our case, we don't really train any models on a single match. Uh, so, um, I well, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a bad idea, uh, but I think it's not. Uh, well, it doesn't really replicate the use case that we have right now, um, because uh, we really need a lot of matches to train a proper model. So um, I don't think that live data, like really training a model during a game to make predictions in that game, would be the most realistic scenario, uh, as it would probably be more realistic to train a model um let's say over a larger data set and apply that model in a live situation so i hope that answers your question um then another question by yigit um which programming language do you use to analyze data and monitor the players um our data science team predominantly works with python so uh besides what i already showed you with respect to our tech stack uh, um, when it comes to the architecture we use Python, uh, we use PySpark, uh, we use SQL. Uh, so those are the well, the, uh, the main languages I think that, that we use. Um, then another question by Toby. Um, is your data science team uh, doing or responsible for this whole, whole pipeline? Um, why uh, yes or no? That's actually, I think a really good question. Um, if I look at our data science team, we have quite a large responsibility. Um, so yes, our data science team is responsible for the entire pipeline. Um, meaning that we always like to say that our data scientists are responsible for, uh, well, the process from the moment raw data comes in. So when raw data is served to the pipeline to until the moment it's in the database. So everything is between, in between is our responsibility as data scientists um why well because that is also where we consider um our data science team to be the experts on uh, so processing raw data into into features into knowledge into analytics and um doing it this way on the one hand gives the data science team a lot of tasks and a large responsibility on the other hand gives them also a lot of ownership and a lot of freedom uh, to quickly develop um new features new models and and to really be in charge of um yeah creating insights from uh, uh from data um but i'm also very curious uh, later on to uh, to hear about other experiences um then let me scroll down to answer some more questions um uh, let me see here a question by Fina again. Do you think 10% deviation in live data impacts decision making for the coaches heavily? Is this generalizable across all metrics provided? Um, does it impact it? Well, I don't think it heavily impacts it, to be honest. Um, often in, in doing such analysis, it's not about the absolute numbers, but it's really, uh, it's really more about the patterns. Um, so, um, yeah, it, it's not about, not like you assess that a player has given two passes too few, for example. Um, and well, this is what could happen if, if you look at the data that way. So I don't think it is that much of a problem, uh, to be honest, I do think that you have to keep it in mind, especially because we're in the event data, uh, there's a, a constant pair, uh, pattern, basically by all KPIs being, let's say 10% lower just because they are missed uh, in the broadcast feed. While in the tracking data, uh, the error is especially um, attenuated in the higher intensities. So 
if you keep that in mind, then it doesn't really impact the decision making. Uh, but if you would compare uh, the data compared to what you would expect based on post match data set, yeah, then it would act, then it 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 could impact uh, your decisions as you could basically be drawn to wrong wrong conclusions. Um, let me see what else we have. Um, do you uh, scroll through the questions? Um, are time-based aggregations feasible to say between game states and the cumulative data shown so far? Um, yeah, definitely. So actually a lot of the things that we do are time-based aggregations where we, um, on the one hand, aggregate up to the latest time point from the beginning of the match. Um, and on the other hand, also aggregate over different parts of the match, for example, a five minute part or a 10 or a 15 uh, uh, minute part. Um, and um, that is definitely possible because yes, we process data in mini batches, um, but we have all the data uh, cached. So we can still aggregate uh, that batch together with other batches uh, as well. So that is, uh, that is definitely possible. Let me see what's out, what's more. Um, yeah, question by Shanak. Um, well, thanks a lot as well for uh, uh, for attending. Um, and the question is, could you please elaborate on how Salesforce deals with live streaming data? What is the tech stack in use? So basically in everything we do, we have we have three teams that, that work on a, uh, on a product or actually a lot more because I'm not doing everybody justice here, but in the development team, there's, there's three like programming teams, the backend developers, the front end developers and the data scientists. Now in our live pipeline, um, a couple of, of main things to, to mention is that our uh, backenders uh, work in C-sharp, um, expose data uh, through Azure Event Hubs, in this case to a Azure Data Factory pipeline. Um, the pipeline is entirely made up out of notebooks and those notebooks are Databricks notebooks. Um, and basically we see notebooks as an interface to execute uh, our uh, Python code. Um, so our Python code typically lives in, uh, in packages that we build ourselves um, uh, that are hosted in, in Azure DevOps repositories. So the, the notebooks are basically just an interface to, um, to use those packages. Um, and then well, the data output uh, goes in this case for the live pipeline through Signal R core um, and then comes into the front end uh, that, that uses Node.js, uh, React and, and uh, uh, kind of things to, uh, well, to basically develop the front end side of things. So that, that's, I think, a comprehensive overview, um, but that, that's more or less yeah, the main things of the tech stack that, that we use here. So let me see if I can answer a final question um, for today's webinar. Um, so um, a question by uh, Jos. Is your optical tracking done through video images so indirectly, so to say? If yes, will there be a time in which data providers will attend the venue and track directly to the pitch with sensors or something? Um, well, the time is already is actually already there. Uh, so uh, if you look um, well the, on the pitch at the moment, uh, players are often tracked using multiple systems. So there are wearable tracking systems and optical tracking systems. Uh, the optical tracking systems are often employed in an entire league, uh, so that allows uh, like a constant uh, a data stream, a data structure that is that is present for all matches. Um, so that's the same system hanging in every stadium and, and collecting the same set of data. Um, but there's also wearable tracking solutions that um, are typically uh, tracking the players of a single team uh, because they're used by the team themselves. Um, but could also obviously be used by both teams and it can also stream tracking data um, in real time, do the pitch. So those, those, those systems exist either as GPS or LPS systems. So LPS are local systems, uh, a bit like what you mentioned that um, are, are there locally tracked 
players using using sensors in a local system and can stream real-time tracking data uh, as well. This is something that is also being used uh, on the training field, for example. Um, so yes, this is possible, but it, it also has, so it, it, it does result in even better quality often, um, but it has other limitations, like for example, that you only have it for one team. The ball is not tracked with a sensor. Um, that is something that uh, in, in football uh, is something that, that's not being done. Um, and people don't like a lot, or players don't like a lot here. So you don't have the ball, while the ball is of course a key, key factor. Um, and you will still need the events as well to give context uh, to, uh, to your data. Um, so thanks a lot uh, for, for all the good questions um, we have here and for attending. If you have any other questions, uh, uh, feel free to, to ask me on Twitter. I'll be available there for the next hour to answer all the questions that I didn't get to uh, right now. Um, uh, and I'm also curious to hear your opinion about what the future should look like when it comes to uh, real-time uh, data analytics. So thanks a lot. And with that, I would like to conclude today's uh, webinar. And um, I hope to uh, speak to you all in the future. Thank you.